speaker. Please welcome on stage uh, Mr. Minister of External Affairs, Sri Dr. S. Jay Shankar, in conversation with Editor-in-Chief Times Now, Rahul Shiv Shankar. Welcome, Dr. Jay Shankar, to the uh, Times Network India Economic Conclave. Uh, we're certainly meeting under strange circumstances, behind glass walls, but we hope to have an interaction that will permeate those walls and uh, bring clarity and, of course, information. Uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, how do you believe the COVID-19 pandemic has influenced international relations, especially in the context of India? And do you believe there has been a realignment of strategic considerations uh, in the international system because of our dip diplomacy? Well, uh, first of all, let me say, Rahul, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I hope we both come back at a time when we see more people in front of us, which I'm sure will happen. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I think you appropriately started with COVID. So look, uh, I think COVID's changed, really changed a lot of things. And uh, people use the word change sometimes very lightly. Uh, uh, from the viewpoint of my uh, domain, uh, first of all, I think, uh, everybody's sense of national security has changed. Uh, today, we would think uh, very uh, naturally of health security uh, as part of national security. Uh, I, I was meeting with some people from the Gulf. They actually said this has made them very conscious of food security because their food flows were interrupted and India was one of the few countries which kept it going during that period. It's also raised uh, big questions about global supply chains, how resilient, reliable those supply chains are. Questions about whether the world as a whole was over-dependent, over-reliant on a few producers. Uh, it's, in a sense, I would say, sharpened the globalization debate as well. Uh, so uh, it's had really multiple uh, consequences. Uh, you know, I think different countries are going to come out of it differently. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a debate, uh, you know, which we used to have in India, this term strategic autonomy. Today I hear those words used by the Europeans uh, about being more strategically auton autonomous because of uh, uncertainty. So it's, it's, it's really driven home the point that uncertainty is a very big factor. Now you ask me, how has it changed things internationally? I think some of it is, you know, what I'm saying. But some of it is also people have looked, uh, whether they admit it or not, at comparative performances, how, how governments and regimes have uh, responded to the COVID challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the fact that, uh, uh, one, we could, on the health front, respond. We set up 16,000 COVID centers. Uh, and, you know, for a country which didn't make PPEs and masks and diagnostic kits, et cetera, we, we sort of created that capacity fairly quickly. More than that, uh, I would say the fact that during this period, uh, the, you know, we, the government was able to feed 800 million people, get food across to them, rations across to them, and able to put money into the bank accounts of 400 million people. I mean, when you tell people about this, they're staggered by the numbers. But uh, it's also a story which hasn't, in my view, got the attention that it should have uh, in the media, our own media, global media. I mean, don't take it as a complaint. I'm just stating a fact. Uh, so I, I do think, uh, I mean, to me it's interesting. You know, you would have seen those polls too. How have leaders and governments come out of COVID? What were they before COVID? Where are they now? 
I would say almost across the world, governments have been challenged. There would be very, very few examples where a government or the leader of the government has come out stronger after the COVID. I would, uh, we are one of them. And so we must have done a few things right. Uh, well, it's very interesting that you talked about governments being challenged because one of the apprehensions about the post-COVID world order is that governments would become more authoritarian because the space to perhaps crack down uh, would increase. Would you, would you believe that that's true of uh, the subcontinent, particularly India? No, I, look, no, not at all. I, I would say, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, when we did the lockdown, you had Weiser saying, why did you do the lockdown? When you lifted the lockdown, you had Weiser saying, why did you lift the lockdown? When you moved money into the bank accounts of 400 million people without going into other people's pockets, they should ask the question, how did it happen? It happened because we are today more digital, uh, our governance uh, is better. So, in fact, I mean, this, you raise it in the context of COVID, but there's a larger point, and the larger point is, somewhere, you know, liberty and freedom is not about bad governance and not, and letting things sort of go along on their own. So, that's a very, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of, I, I don't want to say, I mean, all right, I can't find a better word. I'd say that's a very Jholawala attitude uh, to realities of life. Uh, so, uh, I mean, look, look. So the state, you're saying, needs to become a little more paternalistic in times no, such no. as these? No. no, not paternalistic. I mean, you, again, that would make it sound as though we are overstepping our limits. I mean, this, look, the state has a responsibility. I mean, if the state didn't, ensure people had money, state didn't ensure people had food, state didn't ensure, uh, you know, that uh, they could go for treatment, who else is going to do it? I mean, these are the basic obligations of the state. So, I would actually say, uh, the, I mean, I, I say this with some thought, okay? I think the people of India have got it, okay? The people of India have got it that the state, the government, the people who have been vested with that responsibility today, responded to COVID. And why I say that they've got it is, you look up at all the elections which have happened as the COVID kind of, you know, the numbers came down. Then the elections tell you a story. So I, I think this was, a, uh, frankly, uh, one of the many uh, sort of false debates we are having that, you know, somewhere the COVID would be used for crackdown, etc. I, I think the reality is completely different. Well, I'll come a little later to what the likes of Freedom House and some other liberal democratic institutions have had to say. We'll come to that. But I really want to progress with you on India's emergence, really. And I, I think that's a point that no one can now contest. Uh, the MEA, uh, till March 23, I think, put out a list to say that uh, we have supplied COVID-19 vaccines to, I think, about 76 countries? Yeah, it's, we've added two, three more in the last few days. Okay, yeah. so thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, has vaccine diplomacy brought a perceptible change in how the world now views India? Short answer, yes. Now, long answer. Look, why did we, you know, where we started our... Uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, program, vaccination program uh, at the end of January. And I think our first shipment, if my memory serves me right, went out to the Maldives maybe four days later, uh, and the second to Bhutan the day after. Why did we do that? Okay. We did it because it is actually, honestly, the decent thing to do, the right thing to do. This is what actually any country which is not wholly self-centered, which understands that it's, you know, you can't be secure and if your neighbor is in peril. Huh? It's both, I would say, it's the smart thing and the right thing to do. Uh, we also took the step to make sure, and this was a commitment that PM had made in September to the UN General Assembly, that uh, vaccines would be uh, made affordable and accessible. 
And you know, we had that experience earlier with hydroxychloroquine, which was that the richer, more developed countries were buying them all. Huh? So at that stage, we, we balanced out the, the distribution and the shipments of it. And uh, uh, in fact, we uh, provided medicines, I'm talking of the summer of 20, uh, to 150 countries, and more than half, 82 of them were as grants. Okay. And when I look back on that, and I'll come to the vaccine, look, people, countries, you know, the countries in CARICOM, countries in Pacific Islands, countries in Africa, they were immensely grateful. In many cases, it was not that they didn't have the funds. They didn't have the wherewithal to access it, to buy it, to ship it, to get it, and to, you know, uh, sort of keep the bigger guys uh, at, bay. at bay. So, uh, with all those experiences, Prime Minister was very clear from day one saying, look, you know, in a sense, we have a moral obligation. You know, we keep saying we have a solidarity with Global South, etc. This is a moment to, to sort of, in a sense, put your vaccine where your mouth is. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we've done that. But I would say in an interesting way, because, you know, uh, there's, you, you, the word nationalism is so overused. Uh, I mean, people are calling it vaccine nationalism. I would say it's vaccine self-centeredness because a lot of people are focusing on their own needs, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes to the exclusion of others, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, in our case, I would say uh, uh, what we have done with vaccines, uh, uh, I think is a, is a message to the world. It's a message to the neighborhood. Uh, and it's very much in keeping with what we have done in the last five years. I mean, if you look at a lot of our humanitarian operations in, you know, Mozambique and Yemen and Nepal and so on, or you look, up, look at our stepped-up Africa or Pacific Islands or CARICOM development programs, it is, it is very much a multi, I would say an international vision uh, which, which we have. So, uh, so I, I think uh, in, an, in a fair world, people would uh, recognize that and give you credit. Well, the world uh, is not always fair, and certainly well, not to your government uh, uh, from time I, to I time. Don't so there are a lot of people yeah, sure, sure. I don't who've, been, hold uh, my breath. Yeah. who've been saying, in fact, you know, we have a chief minister in uh, Mamta Banerjee in Bengal. She said, look, the center isn't sending us enough shots, and, you know, we're busy inoculating the rest of the world. I mean, how do you respond to that? Because obviously, to any objective observer, this is a great humanitarian cause, and India has never shied away from its responsibility, and especially when today we're in the chair of the UNHRC, got to step up to the table. So your response to that? Look, Rahul, I, I think we're, we're in the middle of elections somewhere, so people say things in the election. I mean, even at best of times, what they say need to be looked at. At election time, uh, the quality of accuracy is even lower. Uh, but put that uh, aside, uh, you know, when we looked at uh, shipments outside, we, there is a committee, okay, uh, the, the domestic, the pharma people, the health people, the foreign ministry, every, everybody is in it. We looked at our own demand uh, projection, and, and we, had a, we had a domestic plan. And in fact, Dr. Harshwadhan, my colleague, has spoken about it repeatedly in parliament which was first do the doctors and the health workers, then do the police and the frontline workers, then do the military, then do the over 60s and the... And there will be certain margins uh, which will be available because this has a shelf life uh, as well. Uh, so I think that was very much taken into account because from day one, what is it we've been saying? which is that we've always kept our domestic demand in, in mind. So it's a, it's a kind of an inventory uh, management. Uh, calculation management issue. Now, in the coming weeks and months, as we now expand to the over 45s, uh, uh, starting with 1st of April, obviously there's going to be a demand spike, and obviously people are preparing for it. So in many cases, we have told our international partners that, guys, look, COVID rates are going up. Uh, in India, uh, we are expanding our own uh, vaccination uh, ambit. So we are sure you will understand that at this time, we have to purpose it much more focused at, at where we are. 
But so the national the, interest is not going to suffer. That's that's so, what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're speaking on a day when the prime minister is in Bangladesh, uh, doctor. And this is an association that we valued quite a bit and <laughs> nurtured over the last few <clears throat> years, specifically under Prime Minister Modi's uh, look east sort of focus. What have been the tangibles? Uh, you know, uh, in many cases, that's a kind of question I would ask. But in this particular relationship especially, don't underestimate the symbolism, okay? I'm not ducking the, uh, the tangibles. I'm coming to that. I'll tell you why. Because, look, I was, I was 16, almost 17, when these events took place. I mean, it had such a profound impact on this country. I mean, if somebody... I used to tell people in the foreign service, saying, look, my generation, we are the Bangladesh generation. I mean, that was the defining event. Like for the previous generation, maybe they would have said, we are the partition uh, generation. True. Okay. Uh, secondly, after all of that, you know, with the assassination of uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, you saw, you know, uh, what was a uh, very strong relationship uh, go in a very different direction. And uh, so to me, number one, uh, the prime minister's presence uh, there. It has, it's laden with so much meaning. It's very difficult uh, to tell you. And I was in Dhaka uh, just a few weeks before doing the groundwork for his visit. And, you know, I can tell you sort of, it's, it's very emotional uh, there, understandably. Secondly, it's very interesting. Today, uh, Prime Minister has an article uh, in, a, in a Bangladeshi newspaper called Daily Star where he's asked the question, you know, what would have happened to the subcontinent if Sheikh Mujibur Rahman had not been assassinated? I think it is, it is, a, uh, it is a thought which is very much worth thinking about. Where could we have been? Because he gives the answer, which is that, you know, a lot of things we are doing now, because he and Sheikh Hasina are there, that much of those things could have happened earlier had, uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman uh, not been uh, assassinated. And also, I think somewhere all of us in India and certainly in Bangladesh and maybe in the subcontinent should not forget how that happened, who did it, you know, what were the forces at work, because you should not forget, especially when history has been damaging for us, uh, it's not something we should erase from our uh, mind. But today when you ask me what is the tangible change, See, it's not just that we have a great relationship. It's easy to say. We've settled our land boundary. That's a huge thing because bear in mind, you know, your boundary, none of your other boundaries are, are actually uh, finally and firmly settled. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something of enormous uh, consequence. Secondly, what, see, the moment you take the negatives out of the relationship and the land boundary agreement was a turning point in many ways, then the natural positives start asserting themselves. So what has been hap what's happened in the last five, six years? You know, the, what they call the pre-65 connectivity, the railroads, the roads, etc. they're all being rebuilt. Hmm? We inland waterway movement has started. Uh, we have an agreement that the, uh, you know, our people use uh, Bangladeshi ports for shipment, which is good for Bangladesh, it's good for us. Uh, we actually have uh, today uh, power supply from parts of India to Bangladesh. We, uh, uh, you know, fuel supply as well, we hope, from Numaligar uh, refinery very soon. So the economic, you know, uh, partnership grows. And this will have uh, uh, obviously a very, very uh, sort of strong impact on Bangladesh. It will help us not just vis-a-vis -vis our neighbor. I think it will be a game changer in the northeast. It will certainly help Assam. Uh, it will help all the northeastern states. Today, I mean, even a state like Tripura is an immense beneficiary of better India-Bangladesh relations. So I actually am of the view that, you know, the, what we speak about in terms of the Act East, uh, actually to me, Act East starts at Bang in a foreign uh, context. Act East starts at Bangladesh. 
that if our relationship with Bangladesh continues to progress, Bay of Bengal as a plat, you know, as the beginnings of our connectivity eastwards would become much more salient. I think there are enormous possibilities there. And bear in mind one historical point. India has been a great country when Eastern India has been prosperous. Historically, you can make a correlation. It's very interesting because you did say that if we continue to build on this relationship, quick digression, very quick response, because we have so many other questions to go to. Dr. Jay Shankar, what could be a possible threat? Some people have been saying our domestic politics might actually overshadow the relationship. No, I, I, I don't have, have that sense. I, I know, look, some people here will tell you the sky will fall on you tomorrow morning. Okay, there's, there, there are professional... Jhola uh, walas, <laughs> Andolan karis. Uh, there, there are... Andolan uh, jeevis. No, uh, so, but the, the fact is uh, the... Uh, uh, predictors of doom and gloom will do. I mean, that's what that's their job. Okay, I'm telling no, you the record talk, is very different. Let me take an example. CAA, for example. You know, I mean, it's been thrown up in this election. Uh, listen, please look. To, I mean, turn on your own Times Now TV channel. Look at what's happening in Bangladesh. You'll get the answer. Okay. Now, I, I want to ask you a question about Afghanistan. Did you ever envisage that we'd be holding talks with the Taliban? Is India apprehensive about the implications uh, of the peace deal between uh, United States and the Taliban, sir? Look, uh, I would put it to you this way. Afghanistan, you know, Afghanistan has been evolving. Uh, we've, we have President Ghani now. We have President Karzai earlier. Uh, the nature of their uh, dispensation is very, it's a very diversified form of governance in many ways. Rather than uh, link it to a person or a force or a movement, I would put it to you from our perspective. We have a certain feeling for the Afghan people. We have a certain interest in Afghanistan. I mean, I would not deny that. Uh, we have a vision. Uh, I mean, we would like clearly to see a sovereign Afghanistan, a democratic Afghanistan, an inclusive Afghanistan, Afghanistan uh, which is, uh, you know, which uh, takes into account uh, the interests of its minorities, which uh, respects its women. I mean, so there is a there is a world view out there. So the question for us is, you know, if if you know we are to engage such a uh, such a Afghanistan, you know, who which Afghan forces inhabit the face? That is for them to decide. You know, it is not for me prima facie to say I think this is good and that is bad. I mean, I would look at a space... But the a Taliban certain... was problematic in its outlook and it sort of goes against our own value systems. Yeah, but Rahul, we have also been hearing, uh, which we'll have to see, I mean, there is a, there will, uh, this will obviously be tested, uh, that uh, the Taliban, there, you know, there is something called the peace and reconciliation process. And everybody else is saying that the Taliban is reaching out and changing, etc. So let us wait and watch. Okay, wait and watch. Uh, on Pakistan, our other neighbor, there are visible signs of a thaw, Dr. Jay Shankar. We've just had... If you say so. Well, we've had a border agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gone back to a ceasefire agreement. We've had, uh, after two and a half years, resumption of Indus water talks. Um, is this a precursor, Dr. Jay Shankar, to a full-fledged engagement? In your opinion, are we beginning to see that taking place? Look, uh, uh, I think the agreements uh, with the DGMOs, uh, between the DGMOs, uh, was a sensible agreement uh, because uh, I don't think Pakistan either did themselves or us good by uh, encouraging or facilitating infiltrators and uh, terrorists across the LOC and the IB. Uh, and a lot of the firing on the border was a direct derivative of that. So, in a sense, if, you know, uh, there is uh, no infiltration, obviously it it's, uh, stands to reason that uh, uh, there would be uh, no firing because also there would be firing from their side because of the covering fire which you give. Uh, in terms of the uh, Indus water uh, you know, again, 
we'd had talks, okay? Uh, we'd had, uh, we have always been open to the commissioner's meeting because, it, you know, we are both parties to a treaty. There are, we are, we have building certain projects. They have certain views on it. We can argue about the merits of our case. So we've never hesitated from, uh, from that. So I would, if you ask me, are these positive developments? Yes. Uh, so, you know, do I add them all up and make what? Right now, I don't have a good answer to your question. I, but did always, it surprise you that they suddenly, I mean, you know, the general there started speaking I, in conciliatory tones? I am in the government. I'm supposed to know things. So, uh, you know, uh, what so are kind you of... saying that there was some preparation that happened behind no, the scenes? I, look, I, I think the... Uh, I mean, obviously, people analyze, people uh, discuss, people figure out... Uh, At what level was this discussion, so, sir? I would, look, I would say this to you, that uh, uh, we would, we've always wanted normal neighborly relations with Pakistan. Everybody knows what that means. Huh? So if there are trends in that direction, of course, I would, I would uh, welcome it and, and strengthen it. But beyond that, I think uh, it would not, it would be... I think the joint statement really led to the speculation because it was worded Rahul, in such you can fashion. come at it 25 different ways. I would still give you the same answer, which is, you know... Uh, Wait and watch, we're going to... Said, but so. there is a degree of optimism, you would say, that it might translate into something a little more I would say what I have said. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, you're going to be holding a meeting on the sidelines of uh, the Heart of Asia conference in Tajikistan. That's what news reports are saying. Is that a meeting on with your Pakistani counterpart? I am going for the uh, Heart of Asia uh, uh, meeting, conference. Uh, my uh, scheduling is still in progress. Now, so far, uh, I'm, you know, I don't think any such meeting. I, I think, as always, the press uh, is sometimes so far ahead, I wonder uh, what, uh, what is driving them. But do you have any opportunities there to perhaps, you know, talk, have a little bit of a conversation, a pull aside? No, look, Would you be open I'm, to it? Uh, listen. I'm not going to sit here and uh, discuss any of that with you. I'm going for a Heart of Asia conference. And by the way, uh, you know, my Pakistani counterpart and I were both at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization conference as well, which was some months ago in Moscow. But you're open to a pull aside if it were to happen. I think, uh, Rahul, this is time for you to move on to your next okay. question. Okay. So I understand. I mean, it's, uh, it's never easy to second guess a testy neighbor like Pakistan. And, and, I, and I want to bring up another testy neighbor, China. Uh, do you believe there has been any economic impact of the skepticism, Dr. Jay Shankar, uh, with which many see China? Uh, or have the Chinese become virtually indispensable to the economic calculations of most countries to the point where China can't be ignored anymore. Yes, you can have your views on it, can't be ignored, you have to do business with it. Um, I would say, uh, Rahul, that to be fair, uh, the Chinese have a, have a salience in the global economy. I don't think anybody can deny it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, one needs to appreciate, I mean, what they have done in terms of their national capabilities in the last 40, 40 odd years. And I would say strategically, in many ways, they have, starting with Nixon and Kissinger, I think they have outthought the West, uh, not just then, but over successive generations. And not just America, the West as a whole, which, is, which explains why they are where they are uh, today. Uh, what will happen in the future? Difficult to say because there are today a lot of contradictions and frictions out there. But when it comes to us, uh, we need to ask ourselves, so we have this neighbor who's done spectacularly well, so do we just stand there with our hands in our pocket and marvel at what they've done? Or do we say, well, you know, this is an inspiration this is, uh, I need to also, uh, you know, strengthen my competitiveness and my capabilities and so on. 
Uh, when I look back, and this is not a political statement, it is a it is a international relations or even a domestic governance uh, observation. I think we did not think that way. You know, uh, I mean, we were about the same size of economy when Rajiv Gandhi went to China in 1988, and look at the difference today. So, for me, I have always seen lessons in China's growth, in China's importance, salience, centrality, call it what you would. Uh, and I am very glad today to see a very purposeful government, of which I happen to be a part, actually address issues, address issues like infrastructure. You know, yesterday uh, we passed in parliament the day before the development bank uh, legislation. Sure. Address uh, manufacturing, which we have done uh, through uh, the production-linked uh, incentive uh, scheme. Address skilling, address education, address social indices. So if you don't do all of this, then, you know, life's just going to leave you behind. So to me, you know, in many ways, I mean, uh, yes, uh, China is a neighbor and uh, it is in many ways a challenging neighbor. But I, I think I would also uh, uh, urge Indians to see it as uh, really, uh, in a way, um, uh, uh, a country from whom our desire to be competitive and stronger with, you know, with deeper strength should should uh, should be, uh, the, you know, should inspire us. I'm going to beg your indulgence for a couple of other questions. I know we're running uh, short of time, uh, and I just hope that uh, the next panelist uh, allows just two or three more questions. Uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, you've called out, uh, you know, the hypocrisy. Uh, of the self-appointed custodians uh, of the world who find it very difficult to stomach that someday uh, India is not looking for their approval. This is what you said recently. Now, you know, we've had, in the context of the farmers' protests, issues being raised in the British Parliament as far afield as that. We've had noises coming out of the odd senator, congressman in the United States. You had, of course, a hugely critical... Um, uh, group of individuals in our country. Uh, many in India feel that your reaction was overly defensive. What would you say to them? Um, look, uh, I, you know, people abroad and at home sometimes say unkind and unjustified uh, things about us. Uh, us as a country, us as a government. Uh, now, there are two ways you can take it. You put up with it or you call it out. The problem with putting up with it is they then get to define the narrative. So, so you can say, well, you know, I ignored you, but if they say it repetitively, you know you, in the media that it, it has its own impact. So, I think calling it out is not defensive. I think calling it out is called for, it's sensible. Uh, so let me just make, because I'm also a little conscious of time, I need to run. Two, two points here. One, you referred to the British Parliament, uh, or the, I think you mentioned the US Congress as well. You know, uh, our speaker made a, a point, uh, we had the head of the IPU uh, visiting us about two weeks, a week, ten days ago. And our speaker made a point that it's not appropriate for democratic legislatures to pass comments on the working of other democratic legislatures. Okay. I think that's a very good point. So I hope, you know, what we think is a basic courtesy between legislatures should be observed. But if they are not, then I think people need to realize it's a two-way street. That today, if the British Parliament has a debate on what they feel about Indian laws and happenings in India, it's very likely that Indian members of Parliament will feel equally strongly about what's happening in UK or US or, or wherever else, you know, and want to do uh, something similar. Because as I said, courtesy is a two-way street. The larger point, which is 
you know, uh, when, when I spoke about what was being said, uh, look, you've got to understand uh, two, three issues here. One, uh, there, are, there are very, very comprehensive, very deep changes happening in this country, okay? They are political, they are economic, they are social, they are cultural. Now, these changes, because, you know, any, and I mean, in a way, uh, I would say, I would use the word revolution almost, but I would say it's democratic, so normally you don't use that, uh, I mean, uh, you won't say revolution, Phrase, yeah. but you, you understand what I mean. Now, that today is encountering borderless politics, okay? So you can have people uh, here who are politically not doing well, as you can see, uh, who, so the debate doesn't stay there. The debate tends to extend out. Huh? So uh, I think a lot of the noise that you are hearing is borderless politics meeting. So you're uh, saying it's sponsored. Uh, uh, democratic, no, I'm saying what I'm saying, okay. Uh, democratic, a democratic revolution or a democratic transformation at home. That's the first point. Second point, there is much stronger governance in this country, okay? You can, you know, we, we spoke about uh, 400 million bank accounts and 600 million people getting food. Now, why is that possible? Because you actually digitized India, your delivery system is different. So, somehow in this country, there was a view, there was a view that equating freedom and liberty with bad governance or non-governance. So, when you start governing well, when you start, you know, using tools of, legitimate tools of governance and delivering on the ground, it's made out as though, you know, oh my God, you are infringing on freedoms. Look, this is the heavy state uh, sort of uh, doing more than it should. Uh, so this is a, a second issue. A third issue is uh, there's also a tendency, uh, not accidental, to, there's a, there's a, uh, desire or an intent or a program to project leadership as a kind of something overbearing, almost like a dictatorship. Huh? Now, this country needs leadership. I mean, I think if you ask most of the people of this country, I would, do you want to be governed by gray, faceless, uh, nameless people who are taking decisions or probably most likely not taking decisions? Or do you want, I mean, there are, for every country and every society, there's a crunch time. I mean, we saw it at COVID. No, somebody had to take the call. Were you going to let COVID spiral out of control with all the consequences, or did you have the courage? But what people complain about is the lack of consensus making and uh, pushing legislation through L parliament. At Listen, the every one of the issues which we are going through has been debated not months, not weeks, not months, not years, in some cases, decades. I mean, look at uh, the agriculture reforms. Was it a new issue? Was 370 a new issue? I mean, these are all, I mean, these are issues, I mean, many of them uh, since, I mean, in some cases, since I was in school and college. So, look, these are long pending issues in many cases, and of course there are more contemporary issues. Don't, it should not, I mean, it cannot be that the person governing doesn't have to take a decision because uh, there are people outside who say, well, you know, we have a different view. I mean, you, when you are elected, you have a responsibility to govern. When you have responsibility to govern, you have to have the ability to take decisions. So my view is that this country needs leadership. It has leadership. I think the people of India appreciate it. I would point to the electoral democratic validation of that view. And you will get noise from outside. So... As I said, you either put up with it or you call it out. I chose option B. Well, I had a couple of more questions, but we've really maxed out on time. So do pardon me, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, but you sent out a very, very important message to um, foreign parliaments, really, saying that, look, uh, we might also debate all the issues that you are debating, uh, sometimes in a censorious fashion on the floor of your parliament. So watch out. And this is a message that is being sent just before also uh, Mr. Boris Johnson's visit. So that's a very interesting, it's a very, very interesting message to send out there. Thank you, Dr. Jay Shankar. Thank you very much.